Father, we pause and uh, just are grateful for how you work in and among us. Your Holy Spirit guides and directs and brings us along the way and are always there if we reach out to you. Help us to be conscious of that and aware and be obedient to nudges that each of us get that uh, we can be a friend and a help to those around us. And we call you Father God. Uh, today we especially your emphasis on fathers. We think of you and all your characteristics, Father. Uh, we as earthly beings uh, fall short of that. It is our desire and sometimes our images of fathers are not good. But uh, we need to remember that you are our Father to all of us. We thank you for that, for your consistency, faithfulness, mercy, grace that you provide for us. So be with us as we continue our worship here this morning. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just wanted you to know that uh, Ron Bryan is here with us this morning. Ron's in his final few months of being our general superintendent. He announced you know, over a year ago that he would resign December 31st of this year. And so we've been in the process then of uh, looking for a replacement. Uh, it'd be hard to fill Ron's shoes. He's done a great job for us for, what, 12 years? That means all the years were good. We've done a good job for all the time he's been with us. He's been in our yearly meeting then for how long then? When you're past? 30, 39 years. 39 years. He pastored, well, I'm not sure, Pleasant Plain. Uh, were you Fairfield? Legrand. Then Legrand, yeah. And then uh, was <clears throat> uh, asked to be our general superintendent then for the last 12 years. So I wanted to let you know that yesterday then we had our called meeting of the body of representatives to announce that Tom Showalter will be our next General Superintendent. Tom's a pastor in Barberton, Ohio, presently. Uh, his, his bio, he says, uh, he writes his autobiography of Ron and Tom did a class at Barclay College, a master's program in uh, transitional, transformational leadership. And they had to write an autobiography, and, and Tom shared that with us, uh, part of the, his application. He said, the thing you'll notice most about me is I'm 6'8". He's 6'8 and 305 pounds, actually. Yeah, he carries it very well. Uh, tell you more about him later. But I wanted you to know that. He'll be actually in uh, our area, Quaker Heights, a week from tomorrow. Spend a couple of days around the area. And then is going to be in Oskaloosa on Wednesday of, well, the, before the 4th of July. That's about the 1st, maybe. Anyway, uh, looking for homes and housing and be moving here sometime. Maybe we don't know for sure when that will be. Maybe October, middle October or so. We're still trying to work out an actual transition time here. Along with that, then, the other item on our business yesterday, many of you would be interested in, that uh, John McDonald and uh, Brenda, better known as Mac and Bernie, uh, John is a son of Lloyd, have been asked to be the son and of Lloyd and Martha. That's, thank you, Lloyd. It's <laughs> a team effort, I guess. Uh, they'll be the new directors of the Meskwaki Home uh, Center there in, in uh, Tama. And everybody's really excited about that. And among John and Brenda, their, their enthusiasm just... We'll turn it all over to you. Is it my turn? I'm going to walk around a little bit. They'll get you. Okay. Ah, what a privilege to be here this morning. Who would have thought your son was going to be a pastor? <laughs> Not him. <laughs> First camp experience I ever had, he was in my cabin, and it was a difficult day. <laughs> But here he is, going to be a pastor. I was with Donna Williams yesterday. She hung around afterwards because she just had to talk to me. I feel like I'm identifying with that. so much that was said today. I've been 70 for almost a year, by the way. And it is different. <laughs> the new superintendent, one of the highlights in his life he talks about uh, is having been a volunteer fireman in a city in Ohio. 
And I identified with that because I was a volunteer fireman and a volunteer EMTA for a number of years. And, and it's just something about liking to care and be involved with people and, and you learn things and, and it gets difficult. And then uh, just so many things you've shared this morning that resonates to me as, body, as a part of the body of Christ. Your testimony is it, that you shared this morning. Wow. I have a son-in-law who came through Quakerdale. He has three beautiful sons, married to our daughter, and they are now pastors of a church in Newton, Iowa. So you don't know the adventure you're on when you walk into a relationship with Jesus Christ, who is alive and well. You just don't know where he may lead you throughout life. Um, I do have a message, and that's not part of it. But uh, no one told me what time I was to be done. So the good news is I will be done at some point. <laughs> um, provided I didn't throw away my notes. I got to remember to turn this on, right? There we go. Earlier this week, Joyce and I, my wife, attended a funeral for a classmate of hers. He's a member of the LeGrand Friends Church. He came into the LeGrand Friends Church while he was while we were pastors there. And he had lived in LeGrand, I guess, since he got out of high school, or I got out of the army, I guess, and, and had worked in Marshalltown for his entire career. And and the pastor there, Alan, had asked Carla to write down some notes and and she wrote out a little message that he read in the first part of the service. And when I read that, I thought, there's where I want to go this Sunday morning. Oh, and by the way, I interviewed a gentleman four weeks ago who had just returned from Madagascar. And he started his ministry career in South Africa. There are just so many things today that I heard and, and, and it made me feel like, boy, wow, I really am a part of this family. I want to read to you what Carla wrote about her husband, Bob. Bob thought of himself as a cross between a hippie and a good old boy. He was neither well-educated or mechanically inclined, but he had qualities that could not be learned. He was kind and generous and loyal. Once you were his friend, you were his friend for life. One of his greatest gifts was his ability to make people laugh. He loved to play practical jokes on people just to see them smile. And we got to experience all of that. So I, absolutely, this is the truth. I know some people looked at us as an odd couple and wonder how in the world we ever hooked up. Bob came into my life during a very dark period of my life. She said, we both love to dance, something neither of us were very good at. And that was our first bond, but it didn't take me long to see all of his wonderful qualities. And at the age of 24, he just got, spent four years in the Army, he took on the responsibilities of a wife and a father to three little girls. And God bless us a year later with another beautiful daughter. Our life together was not without its rocky moments. We had our ups and downs like every couple, but his strong love for our family always seemed to pull us through the toughest of times. Even if he was upset with me, he would write me a love note. Listen to this. He would write me a love note telling me how much he loved me, something he did often during our 43 years together. He was a loving father and grandfather, and they all knew that there was nothing they could do that would ever change that. His love was unconditional. Bob found Christ as his Savior about 15 years ago, and I'm happy to say that my wife Joyce had a large part to play in that conversion. And one of his greatest joys was going to Sunday school and church to study God's Word. I count Bob's salvation as his greatest gift to me personally and to his family because it gives us peace to know that we will see him again someday in heaven.
That was a very honest account of a dear friend. Father's Day. My father and I, I grew up as the second child of seven. We lived on a farm. We had cows and chickens and pigs and ponies and sheep. And my dad thought it was necessary to work from sunup to sundown. He turned a clay farm into a productive farm and he worked hard. At age 54, he sold the farm and started a little ski area down at Montezuma, Iowa that grew into a pretty flourishing business before he passed away in 1992. My dad and I didn't always get along. You see, I thought he got pretty stupid at about age, my age of 16. I reminded a grandson of mine a few days ago, because he was going through a tough time, he's 16, and uh, I said, remember when I told you when you were about 14 to promise me you wouldn't get stupid when you got 16? Huh? <laughs> well, he's going through a stupid time. But we love him. We love him dearly. And I told him, I said, I, I re as I reflect back on my life, I realized I would never want to be 18 again because of my relationship and my own household and my father was not fun. But when I was in the Air Force sitting in Okinawa in 1965, a little light went on in my own mind and heart. And it occurred to me that many of the things that I thought I wanted in life, I already had. And while I was overseas, and unbeknownst to me, my dad knelt beside the rear tire of his John Deere tractor as he was cultivating and accepted Jesus Christ into his life. And he thought it was silly for me to go to Bible college, because none of us kids ever went to college. But the first time I ever saw him weep was the day I presented my senior chapel. And I didn't know how to take the hug, the kiss. I want to look in Joshua 24, verse 15 this morning, and a little bit about Joseph. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now that's a a very well used verse in the Bible. What a statement. Joshua. He had been leading a million people out in the wilderness and they crossed over the river Jordan and gone into Canaan land to possess it because God had told them that he had he had gotten it ready for them and, and he'd been leading these armies and had all these massive battles and, and I've been rereading the entire Bible myself in the last year and I've just been fascinated with stuff that I apparently missed the other couple times I read it. God is alive and well and he was speaking to Joshua at the very, toward the end of his life and it was time for him to retire. Maybe that's why I like it right now. But Joshua made this speech in front of the whole people. He says, but for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And he did. Now, he'd had all kinds of problems to overcome. But Joshua made a statement. You realize I got the reading in, in Exodus. Joshua was this young man that Moses... Had, had a, a picked him out, I guess, or God had assigned him to be with Moses all the time while they were getting the, the Ten Commandments and stuff like that, all those things in the book of Exodus. And in and, and one place it says, when they had built this little tent, this little tabernacle before they built the big one, the tent of meeting it was called, it says there in Exodus that Joshua would go with Moses 
into that tent. But then it said as the last little footnote, and I'd never seen it before, Joshua never left the tent. He stayed there around the clock all those years serving the Lord and serving Moses. In reality, he'd become a, Moses was his mentor. We like to use the word coach or mentor today. And he walked in it throughout his life. In Genesis 37, verse 13, I want to switch to Joseph a moment. I guess I'm supposed to advance that, aren't I? Sorry. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am being, I'm going to send you to them. And Joseph, a young man who was a bit annoying to his older brothers, you know, the coat of many colors and all those stories that we know from the first part of Genesis there. But here, you start to see the character of this young man. He was obedient. He got up and said, okay, Dad, I'll go talk to the brothers. He honored his father and followed his instructions. And his reward, he was met with treachery. He got over there. The brothers didn't like him. And they conjured up this idea. Let's, first, they were going to kill him to get rid of him because he was annoying. And then they decided to sell him into slavery. And Joseph suffered a lot. You know, but everywhere he went, it looked like, just without the time, it looked like he was going to be really rewarded and become really a, an important and famous person or something like that in Potiphar's house. Uh, something bad would happen and he'd get thrown into prison. And, and he was supposed to get out of prison because he made a promise with a couple of the other prisoners if they got to see the emperor or king or pharaoh, whoever it was at that time. And at the, he would let them come out. Encourage him to come out of prison as well. They left him there for a couple of years. At one point they were going to kill him. He got out. Because he'd interpreted a dream. And the Pharaoh put him in charge of the whole country. Made him the, the prime minister of Egypt. And then there was this big famine that came along. Seven years of it. Remember the stories? And about three and a half years in, uh, his father and brothers were still living up in the land of Israel, and they went down there to find food. And, and I'm not going to give you the whole story, but they, they came down, and Joseph recognized them, and they didn't recognize him, and he played a couple tricks on them, trying to get their attention. Finally, it all came to a head, and, and the brothers realized, he, he declared to them who he was. And they suddenly realized they were totally at this man's mercy. He could have ordered them slaughtered right there on the spot. But then there's this verse in 50, verses 17 through 20. It says, this is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. This, by this time, Jacob, his father, knew that his son was alive and his sons, his other sons and the other 11 or so needed to go back down to Egypt and he said, this is what you need to go tell him. Please forgive. Please forgive. Forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. He reminded them that, that he was serving the Yahweh the Almighty God, the Creator. And then please, he said, forgive your brothers. And this is kind of, again, speaks to the character of Joseph, who some people would write and say he's the best model in the Old Testament of who Jesus was when he was on earth. When Joseph heard these words, it says he wept. It gripped him by the heart. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. And he could have used them as slaves. But then Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? 
Am I God? You intended to harm me, but God intended for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. What an outlook. It would have been really easy for Joseph to have hated his brothers and taken advantage of the situation. But again, think of this, this, these last few words. You meant it to me as harm, but God made it for something good. You know, and, and I mentioned my son-in-law, uh, who is now a pastor in Newton. If you knew his whole story, you'd say he had every reason in the world to continue down the path, which was the path of not just rebellion, but in trouble with the state, incarceration. But along the way, he found Jesus Christ. By the way, he met my daughter when they sang in, what was the name of that group? Set apart. The youth group and I, the yearly meeting, had set apart a few years. They met there because they sang together. And then there was a, a, a blank void in both their lives, and suddenly they ran across each other in the town of Newton one day, a few years ago. James is his name, and he... He has been on the other side, so he has learned a lot of lessons, which now, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, they returned. He took a group uh, to Kenya, and they preached outdoor preaching services, and they held healing services in Nairobi and out into the bush, as they refer to it, in Kenya. And dozens of people either came to know the Lord or were restored in their relationships or were actually physically healed. Of course, he thinks he wants to move to Africa now. And I don't think that's such a good idea. We, we moved so we'd be closer to those three little grandbabies <laughs> in our retirement. Proverbs 22 says, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. All of these verses in this particular holiday today are just so heavily fraught with uh, memories for me. I've had some lot, I guess, and not some, quite a bit of deep thinking. Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Well, what if you never had a father? That's not a problem. Today, you can just go to a store and buy one, right? The society we live in has made things look pretty easy and pretty cheap a lot of the time. But there's so many statistics that we're hearing if you're listening. I titled this Father, Fathers, Who Needs Them? Well, we all do. <laughs> or we wouldn't be here. And there's a myriad of reasons. The vital statistics today suggest fatherless families are vulnerable to all kinds of greater risks in education, in discipline, in lawlessness, greater obstacles to overcome in maturity and in actually participating in their own family and marriage someday, as well as success in the quality of life. I had a very good friend who spoke to me frequently about his childhood his lack of not having a father in the home and ultimately becoming an orphan. And he and his brother were assigned to an orphanage in southern Missouri. Another reason why today I thought, wow, the stories we heard in open worship. 
He shared with me ultimately becoming an orphan and about becoming an orphan and how he had gotten out of that orphanage by being hired out by some men who caused him to go work in the fields over in Oklahoma and southern Missouri and, and day laborers, you know. Eventually, though, he served in the military in World War II. And when he got out of college, because of the benefits of having served in World War II, he was able to go to college. And he eventually became the school superintendent here in Iowa. He overcame a tremendous amount of obstacles. And he raised his own children and saw them all become successful in life. And when he spoke with me about these things, he spoke with tears in his eyes about the hardships, no shoes, poor schooling, hard work, long hours, no real family or oversight. He's gone to be with the Lord now. Some of you would have known him. But his faith was genuine and he wanted to pray with me. One day he came by and he said, I'd like to pray with you. This is a school superintendent. Highest position in this small town community. A professional level. And we talked a little about it. He says, well, are we going to pray? Well, yes, sir. <laughs> and he said, okay. He stood up, turned around, and got on his knees at my chair. He says, let's pray. I was overcome. He was successful, but he was humble. He was genuine. All attributes that we need to have. He was not afraid to express in whom and to whom he had placed his faith. Recognized his, leader, his relationship to God and man and lived his life to the fullest, serving others until he was no longer able to, li to live. Can we make it? Yes. God has shown us a better way if we will walk. In it. Love, honor, respect, forgiveness, commitment, integrity. These are all parts of the character of the person of God. I was reflecting earlier this week on my own life. It came to me very clear that even though I had made attempts to receive God, and even though I was raised in the church, it was not until I was 31 years old that I yielded and consecrated myself to God. Then and only then did I finally receive a strong sense of joy and purpose in my life. Did I have much to learn about parenting? Almost all of it was yet before me. You see, I was busy. I was busy with my life. I was busy with my job. I was busy with my recreation. Do you see a common word in this confession? My. My job, my career, my recreation, my this and my that. Our lives are to be spent in drawing closer to God and doing so, learn more about Him, more about love, more about life, and more preparation for life eternal. I am thankful today to have the opportunity to hold my grandchildren and hug them and share my life with them. I guess I hadn't seen this one coming. To have my, we have 16 grandchildren and five children, the oldest of which is 24, and we did our first wedding last October, and it looks like we're going to have two more very soon, and another one I was writing about love on Facebook. <laughs> but the opportunity to hug them and share my life with them and the joy I feel sometimes is indescribable. I'm also made keenly aware of the things I missed along the way when my own children were young. 
making intentional time for God and family. Joshua said after leading a whole bunch of rebellious people, after leading a mighty army through many battles and victories and losses, at the end of his career, as he was gathering his family and heading back to the village that had been awarded to him by God, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I think it's a conscious choice that each one of us need to make along the way. But please don't give up. There are many obstacles and battles and situations that we can't see yet. But God is faithful. And he has this marvelous ability to do a miracle and take something that was meant to be harmful and turn it into something that is good. Which you'll carry with you as the Apostle Paul said, there is stored up for me a crown. And I want to possess it. Follow Jesus. Let me close with prayer. Gracious Lord, what a marvelous, marvelous day we are having. Thank you for the fellowship and the warmth of being a part of the family of God. Jesus, walk alongside of us. Help us get up off our knees sometimes when we fall, perhaps even flat on our faces. And help brush us off and, and put us back on the straight path. And we'll thank you for it. We'll praise you for it. And let us all be a part of your household that will serve you forever. In Jesus' name, amen.
Yeah, I think Lindsay was the one you referred to as your first one was married last October then. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an exciting time for everybody then. Are there other reflections? as a result of the, our time together this morning. Made me, as Sophie was playing, we, I really appreciated that. Uh, very good song. Um, when Scott was a youth pastor in Des Moines at a church, they were kind of a hierarchy, higher up sort of a church, apparently, because they wouldn't let the youth do music because they didn't want mistakes. They had a hired choir director and maybe choir members even. And they did some pretty high class stuff. The organist was paid pretty well probably. <laughs> uh, but Scott talked them into letting the youth do a, a whole service one morning. They did the music and everything too. But I just remembering uh, how we've, Alice and Brown and Sophie and others have come along, you know, that we let them play the special music and things at different times. And Jared, Jared Jaguer's played a few times, you know. How far Sophie's come, how far she's going. Uh, it's just exciting to see, see the way the Holy Spirit moves and our family here. Um, anything else? Any other reflections? <clears throat> I think KD has an announcement here before we... Uh, of our final song. Waiting on bated breath. Okay. Um, we have a, a tradition here that we, we have not uh, done today. And I know, I, I believe we have a few folks here from Mission. I know Mr. Bear is here, at least. Uh, Sophie, prior to people um, going on missions trips, we usually take time to pray for you in that trip coming up. And we'd like to try and do that right now. If you would come up, and also your family, if you would come up, and then those from missions, if you would come up, please. Right up here. Any family member, it's okay if you guys come up. We're so blessed to have Sophie go out and be a missionary, and we just want her to know that we love her, and we will support her in prayers financially, and, and that she should be in our thoughts every day. Uh, just be with her, Lord, and just guide her and protect her, and let her know that we love her. We thank you, Jesus. Sophie, you probably heard me a couple years ago talk about uh, those three o'clock in the morning phone calls that uh, sometimes people would like to make, and you, you hear me talk about that at graduation. Again, keep in mind, the folks that just came up here with you are the folks that you are able to call at three in the morning, or anybody that you see here in this church are folks that you can call at three in the morning. John said he would take it. Huh? He's got that smart watch, so it just kind of vibrate on his arm until it wakes him up. So. <laughs> um, I, I was asked, by the way, I, I do have the person that has the most handsome tie. However, before I, I do that, um, I've been asked to have the gentlemen who have worn your bow ties to please stand up again I was asked to have you parade in the aisle, but if you would just stand up and turn toward
toward the opposite end so that folks can see you so they can get a good close look. And then I'll have John and Ron come a little bit closer so that folks can see. Because Ron has a really, really nice tie. I believe it has cupcakes on it, if, that, if I remember correctly. That's what Joyce calls it. Cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Another one of those things that, yeah, just kind of leave alone. OK, according to what I have in my hand, we do have a winner of the most handsome tie, and it goes to Bob Alpers. <laughs> and this is what it says. For sheer creativity and originality, by the way, it'll only work once. <laughs> and then we also have honorable mention to Dick Talbot. So, Bob, if you would come forward, please. And, and thank you guys for standing up. I appreciate it. For those of you guys who did not have an opportunity to uh, see Bob's uh, tie, he is wearing a literal bowl, a Christmas bowl. And when I saw him this morning, I, I, I thought, man, this thing almost matches his shirt exactly, too. So. I don't think anybody can out top that, although, you know, Dick's pretty, pretty good in there. But anyway, in doing what you did, you are receiving an actual bow tie that you'll be able to take home with you. So thank you. It's been good to be gathered corporately together in worship this morning. Thank you all for being part of that. If you would uh, join with us in our closing hymn, we'd like to stand hymn number 394. We'll sing through twice. Greater is he that is in me. And the, word, and the meditations of our hearts be with us as we go from here. You are dismissed.